Okay, we're now live for this presentation today. Uh, so uh, this one, uh, Al, I'll let you uh, introduce our speaker, but I'll just mention uh, and thank again to, uh, thank again Quanex uh, for being presenting sponsor. Uh, with that being said, Al, your turn. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to introduce our next guest, Chris Ballard of Passive House Canada. Uh, Chris just reminded me that he uh, joined the Passive House Canada about a year ago and on his first day on the job, he and I met at Windor last year in Toronto and uh, had our first conversation. Uh, so that was uh, an interesting opportunity to uh, get to know him a little bit. Um, Chris is the CEO of Passive House Canada. We, we know a lot, of, we, we've heard of Passive House Canada before. It, what's interesting is that he's a businessman and entrepreneur who ran his own company for more than 30 years. That's a pretty good track record for, uh, you know, knowing how to manage things and understanding the challenges of the business owners, uh, you know, in the, in the window industry. So uh, I think that's, uh, you know, an excellent, excellent background. Uh, Chris also assisted with the launch of other businesses as well. He's a former member of the Ontario Provincial Parliament, Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Minister of Housing, and Minister responsible for Ontario's Poverty Reduction Strategy, and also a member of the Ontario Treasury Board. So, uh, Chris, uh, you, you uh, come to us with uh, excellent qualifications, uh, certainly to uh, you know, help lead, you know, the future of uh, innovative fenestration through the work you're doing at Passive House Canada. So thank you for agreeing to be a guest with us today and uh, telling us uh, about uh, what's new and the growing demand for Passive House windows in Canada, as well as other kinds of high performance windows. Thank you for being with us. Great, and, and thank you all for the invitation. And uh, I will say it was almost a year ago, it'll be a year ago, I guess tomorrow, uh, when uh, we first met and I sat in on your presentation and my predecessor, Rob Bernhardt's presentation and thought to myself, wow, do I have a lot to learn, especially around the fenestration industry. Uh, and a year has flown by, lots of exciting challenges. Uh, and I can tell you that I still have a lot to learn about uh, not only high performance buildings, but the role that uh, that fenestration plays within um, those uh, those high performance buildings. So again, thank you for uh, uh, the invite to be here today. I've, I've got a presentation that sort of touches on a number of things. Um, and uh, I may skip a few slides if I find that I'm, I'm getting repetitive, but um, please, uh, you know, use your uh, 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 question buttons or chat buttons to, uh, to ask questions. And, and uh, when I get a break, we'll answer as many as we can. Um, and I, I'm not a technical person. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a, a building scientist. So I, I don't want to get too deeply into the weeds because uh, I could give you the wrong answer, but if there is a technical question for me, I'll make sure that it gets to our technical people and, uh, and we can get back to you. So I thought today that I would, uh, after talking with Al, focus a little bit uh, about, uh, or talk a lot about what's happening in the Canadian market, uh, what's happening in North America, um, and then, uh, and even before that, just touch on some of the reminders about why we're here and why we're talking about high performance buildings at all. So uh, without further ado, let me get going. And once again, uh, thank you to Fenestration Canada for the opportunity uh, for Passive House Canada to present um, we are the National Association advocating for healthier, uh, affordable, comfortable buildings that contribute to a sustainable future. Um, so who is Passive House Canada? If you haven't seen this slide before, all of these folks are uh, Passive House practitioners, architects, engineers, contractors, fenestration people. Um, and the one thing I learned quickly about the Passive House community is how much they like to share information. By day, they are uh, fighting tooth and nail uh, for contracts, they're competing with each other. Uh, but by night, over a coffee, uh, these days a virtual beer perhaps, uh, they're helping each other solve high performance building issues, Passive House uh, uh, issues. And it's 
it's a very supportive community. And, and that's what I would like to offer to uh, members of Fenestration Canada, that, that uh, if you have an issue, if you have a question, um, we have people who would be happy to uh, have a chat with you, grab a coffee, whatever, and help you through uh, whatever issues, whatever questions you may have. But Passive House Canada is a, a membership-based social enterprise. Uh, our main focus, uh, we have two main focuses. One is advocacy and the other is, um, uh, the other is education and professional development. And we offer a, a lot of education and professional development. Uh, everything from um, uh, helping people become certified Passive House Institute designer consultants, that's kind of the, the upper level, to um, people who, uh, contractors and others who just need to know about Passive House or trades people who need to know what's different about building a Passive House. Uh, you'll hear me say it a million times throughout the presentation because it's so true. What we're about is not rocket science, but it is building science. Uh, and uh, I find that with a bit of support, uh, people can get on board and, and build to this high quality. So we uh, offer technical services uh, and we have uh, members uh, and staff all across the country. So we are truly a national organization. We play a big role um, internationally as well. We're one of the largest Passive House affiliates in the world. Uh, and we, uh, we work with the United Nations uh, to helping establish global standards uh, and, uh, uh, and, and other Passive House organizations um, in North America, South America, uh, in fact, uh, almost all the way around the world. So we're acknowledged as uh, as, as being one of the biggest and most active. So our mission really three points, uh, to make zero emission buildings known and adopted by government, industry, and the public, uh, to support government and industry, and that includes you at Fenestration Canada, uh, in the, the transition to, to high performance buildings and components through education, certification, and policy development and really to promote the Passive House Institute building standard, which is globally recognized as the highest level building standard. And I, I want to say here and now that we're not uh, an exclusive club. There are a number of ways to get to a number of standards and a number of paths to get to improved uh, energy performance but it's globally recognized and now the United Nations and even their regulations or their suggested regulations are pointing to um, the passive house metrics as being uh, top end. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a while. But the one thing I want to drive home, and if you've seen uh, one of my presentations, you'll seen this slide before, I like to drive this home that our ancestry is Canadian. Uh, this is the Saskatchewan Conservation House. Back in the 70s, um, we had the, the first oil crisis, uh, the OPEC oil crisis, and the Canadian, the federal government in many provinces were quite worried about how Canadian homeowners and businesses were going to make it through the cold winter. Uh, so they started looking around at different ways to build. And uh, the Saskatchewan government uh, funded together with some money from the federal government they hired uh, a fellow, an engineer by the name of, uh, of uh, Harold Orr, who together with his colleagues uh, built this, which in a set essence is the first, uh, the first passive house uh, in the world, we'll say, using state-of-the-art theory about how to build to uh, high-performance buildings. 1977 in Regina. This house is still standing today. It still performs today. And the Passive House Institute, which is based in Europe, points to this house. I think there's even a plaque on the, on the, near the entryway, points to this house as being one of the early examples of, of, of what we would call today uh, the Passive House building standard. So Passive House is not a foreign concept. It started, it had, it had some of its roots here. Uh, other cold climates, uh, not surprising, uh, northern U.S., uh, uh, some of the European uh, northern communities were doing similar things. But the European scientists came to Canada, came to Regina to study this house. Uh, and I think as Canadians, we should all be very proud of that. 
So moving ahead. Now, here's a bit of magic uh, I hope works. Uh, I have a 90-second YouTube video for those of you uh, uh, who are wondering what exactly is a pacifist. I'm going to click the button. Uh, let's hope that it works. If not, I'll give you the URL and you can go watch it at your own time. We might, we might just not have the sound uh, on it. Ah, okay. If you, if you want the sound, you could just share your screen and you just need to check the... When you share your screen, there's a little uh, checkbox to uh, to share the sound too. So if you want to, okay, yeah, you'd have to stop screen sharing now and then just start okay. again with uh, the little uh, box checked. So click. Do I click the new share? Uh, well, yeah, oh, no, you could stop do that. Share, you, sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There we are. This one. Okay. And then now I will. Yeah, you have share I will computer do, sound. I will. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily have that. So let's see what we can do. You know what? I'll start it. If you can't hear, I'll stop it. I'll carry on and I'll let you know what the URL is. It was supposed to be a plugin that allowed the sound to, uh, but it doesn't even look like it's, oh, hang on. Is it working? Yeah, it's loading. I don't know if we're going to hear the volume. No, uh, it's not even going to play. No, it's not playing. Darn that technology. I really apologize. <laughs> I thought I had it whipped. I, uh, I, I downloaded the appropriate plugs in, plugins. I thought I would be, be smart. Uh, clearly not smart enough. Um, but we will... Uh, Passive House explained in 90 oh, seconds. Here you go. You hear that? Here you go. Does yeah. your house have a heater in the basement or maybe a fireplace? Probably also a central air unit. Did you ever wonder if it was necessary? In 1991, a physicist in Austria, Dr. Feist, built the first passive house. Here's what he did. One, proper insulation. It's just like wearing the right winter jacket. It also doesn't need a heater. Two, no air leakages. There should be no holes, small or large, to let hot air out of the house. Three, no thermal bridges. A thermal bridge is like a road for heating energy in which warmth can travel right through your walls. As a matter of fact, most of our houses have thermal highways in our walls where heat can easily travel to the outside. Plus, the house needs proper windows most of the time with triple pane glass. It needs to be oriented properly so the sun can heat it in the winter and shade is provided in the summer. And it uses an HRV, a device that provides the inside with fresh air without letting the heat out. Add all these things up, and it turns out your house doesn't need a heater or air conditioner. So where does the heat come from? A passive house needs 90% less energy, and that can easily be supplied by your body heat, the sun, your appliances, light bulbs, and even your TV. This saves you a lot of money on your heating bill and helps preserve the environment. Did we make it in 90 seconds? You bet we did. There we are. I'm, I, I'm, I'm hope that uh, uh, everyone could hear that okay. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun little introduction to Passive House uh, in 90 seconds or less. Uh, and uh, um, I think it explains the key components. Um, it doesn't talk about Canada, unfortunately. Uh, and it doesn't talk about the role of many scientists in designing uh, Passive House standards. Uh, but because it really was a European Union uh, effort to uh, design this standard. But I want to say, uh, quite frankly, did you know the world's lowest energy and lowest emissions buildings are also, also healthier, comfortable, more comfortable, affordable, resilient, and contribute to a sustainable future? That is the high performance uh, passive house building. Um, we like to say, and our, our, our slogan is, uh, build better, feel better. Uh, if you uh, live, work, uh, play in a passive house building, you uh, enjoy year-round stable indoor air quality and temperature. I love to look at the, the charts of uh, passive house buildings where we watch the temperature barely move over months on end, maybe uh, plus or minus three or four degrees. Uh, that's the, an indicator of, uh, of a well-built passive house uh, that uh, you don't get wild fluctuations uh, in temperature. That makes it really comfortable. Um, it, it's quiet and comfortable throughout the changing seasons, 
If you ever get an opportunity to visit a, a passive house building, um, probably one of the first things you'll notice when you enter the house uh, and shut the door behind you is just how quiet it is. And it's one of the great appeals to uh, residential passive house, quite frankly, especially in urban settings where there's fire trucks and ambulance and police and road noise and uh, all of that sort of thing going on. To be able to go into your, uh, your apartment, your condominium, your, your office and shut the door and have some quiet, uh, it's one of the great hallmarks of uh, passive house buildings and, and one that I don't think we, uh, we recognize and talk about enough. Um, there is, of course, substantial reduction in energy use, you know, up to 90% on a new build and up to 70, 70 or 75% uh, on an Enerfit, a retrofit model uh, compared to the previous model. So up to 90% over a code built uh, building and about 70 to 75% uh, on a retrofit. Um, so that leads to substantial reduction in energy use and operating costs. One of the, the beauties around operating costs is the passive house is much simpler to build. You don't necessarily need very complex heating and cooling systems in it. You can put simpler uh, systems in, which means it costs a lot less to maintain. Um, and that uh, the passive house uses very simple and durable systems. Uh, one of the other things I'll talk about uh, very briefly here, I think I touch on it later on, is quality assurance. Uh, passive house is big on quality assurance. You can't uh, pass an air test, an air pressurization test of your passive house building, unless you've been building uh, the right way, constructing the right way from the ground up so that uh, your walls are airtight, you know, the windows have been installed properly, the glass is all installed properly. If you haven't done that, then you're not going to pass the blower door test, the pressurization test. And that really means that uh, when people are in building, the contractors, the tradespeople, they have to pay special attention to uh, doing things right. Uh, and that means uh, quality assurance. Before the drywall goes on, before the building is finished, um, you know the building is being tested for, uh, for excellence in construction. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, why all this talk about uh, passive house and high performance buildings and, and whatnot. Um, well, you know, it really comes down to this. Um, this is a chart of Toronto's future weather. Uh, we see that, uh, you know, in the next, uh, by 2040, 2050, the average uh, daily temperature max is going to hit 44 up from 37. We're going to have 66 of really hot days up from an average of 20 over the past 10 years, extended heat waves, uh, and lots more rain than we ever had before. And of course, we all know that this is because of something called climate change. And um, uh, in, in, a, in my previous life as uh, Ontario's Minister of Environment and Climate Change, these are the sorts of things we were dealing with every day. There are, there are two questions that we had to face how do we mitigate climate change? In other words, how do we stop it or at least slow it down? It's too late to stop, it's here already. How do we mitigate or slow it down? Uh, and how do we adapt to this climate change? Seeing what Toronto is going to be facing, for example, um, every part of Canada will be affected in a different way. It may be, uh, it may be uh, flooding at high tide on the coasts. Uh, it may be extended heat waves. Uh, it may be drought, but every part of Canada is going to be affected. So we have to mitigate and adapt. And that's where these high performance buildings are coming in. Um, I probably don't have to show this slide, but I will, because it's a good thing to uh, remind ourselves about why Toronto's weather and the rest of Canada's weather is going to get increasingly more severe uh, over the next 30 years something called the greenhouse effect. Uh, you uh, being in the, uh, the, the uh, fenestration industry know a lot more than I do about, the green, about greenhouses and greenhouse effect, uh, but it's simply that uh, um, with increasing amounts of primarily carbon dioxide high in the atmosphere, it acts like a blanket that traps heat 
in the earth. So the, the energy from the sun comes through uh, and most of it used to bounce right back out again. But when you have that thick wool blanket or that CO2 blanket encompassing the earth, the heat tries to escape but gets trapped and is reflected back uh, down and uh, onto the earth. So um, interestingly, we can trace uh, this era of, uh, of climate change uh, almost back to the Industrial Revolution when we uh, mechanized the uh, mining of coal and the burning of coal and the great carbon dioxide dump began. Uh, but the next slide will be the last, uh, the last slide about greenhouse gas pollution. This is a NASA uh, chart that I uh, uh, just pulled down the other day. Uh, we can see uh, you know, the ups and downs of increased carbon dioxide, lower, upper, lower, down. You know, there were big volcanoes sometimes that spew a lot into the air. But you can see that 1950, 1950 is where we hit the, uh, uh, that 300 parts per million concentration. And you can see it's a straight line heading up as we burn more and more fossil fuels fossil fuels, which of course give off carbon dioxide. We can't blame that chart on, well, it was active volcanic year or some other uh, natural uh, phenomena. The scientists are unequivocal in their agreement that, uh, that climate change is real. Uh, it's being caused by the greenhouse uh, effect and the greenhouse effect is uh, because of uh, um, our activities, namely burning fossil fuels and creating, uh, um, creating carbon dioxide. So with all of this in place, um, the next question is, you know, what are governments going to do about it? And what are they doing about it? Uh, you've heard of this uh, a meeting uh, called the, an agreement called the Paris Accord, where virtually every uh, country in the world came together for a series of meetings. The final one was in Paris, hence the name. Uh, where they came to an agreement that in order to mitigate climate change, they'd have to work together. Uh, and uh, from that, uh, governments are doing this. The, the provincial, territorial, and federal governments sat down 2016, and they came up with the, the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change. Uh, and it's committed to uh, developing and adopting uh, increasingly stringent model codes starting in 2020, that's almost over, uh, with the ultimate goal of having all new buildings constructed to a net zero energy ready. That's the high performance building, that's the passive house building we're talking about, but having that net zero energy ready standard by 2030. So that's 10 years away. Um, but that uh, doesn't mean that we don't do anything. We don't sit on our hands for the next 10 years until 2030 comes. We all have to, uh, um, we have to be ready. And indeed, a lot of the uh, carbon neutrality and move is being driven at the municipal level. Um, and we have, for example, the Transform TO goals. Uh, you probably have heard of uh, the uh, Toronto Green Standard. Uh, it's going to drive massive uptake of high performance buildings and therefore uh, fenestration products, high performance fenestration products, many of them uh, designed and manufactured to a Passive House Institute standard um, in, the coming, uh, in, in the coming months, next couple of years ahead. Um, the transform TO goals is 100% of new buildings are near GHG emissions by 2030. That's the near zero. That 100% of buildings are, are retrofitted by 2050. All of these buildings are going to need um, good quality fenestration products. And that uh, uh, city owned facilities and city owned buildings uh, will also uh, become uh, uh, near zero emission uh, buildings. So the, uh, uh, the guiding principles for this, obviously there's a whole bunch, but uh, we talk about, uh, the Toronto talks about social equity, uh, low income protection for low income residents, um, et cetera. Maintain and create good quality local jobs is something to keep in mind. 
uh, strengthen the local economy, something to keep in mind because we talk to government uh, about, and, and coming from that background myself, it's very important that, um, that the, the downside of, of um, a climate change has to have an upside. We have to be able to strengthen our economy as we address climate change, as we address uh, what needs to be done in terms of buildings, that we, we use these as opportunities to create investment, to create jobs here in Canada. So there's, uh, these are the six guiding principles that Toronto's using. And I'm using Toronto here, uh, and you can see this slide across the bottom. It has our name, it has the, the Atmospheric Fund name, and the City of Toronto. We've been working uh, with the City of Toronto, not only on these standards, but, but primarily to educate uh, a lot of Toronto staff about, um, about high performance standards, about passive house standards, and about uh, um, a little bit about uh, uh, little reminders about climate change and why we are where we are today. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the targets for Toronto, and again, I bring this up because uh, in talking with Al, really wanted to highlight the opportunities uh, and the opportunities for the fenestration industry in Canada uh, are staggering. Um, you know, it provided provided we have um, the product and, and, and the, 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 the tradespeople, the skills uh, to install, but we, we will seriously have to ramp up uh, manufacturing uh, here in Canada to meet the coming need. And it, it don't wait to 2030. Um, get on board right now and, and start to, um, if, if you're not moving down the path to uh, developing a, a passive house, uh, high performance window or product, um, you need to get on that uh, uh, right away. So target, uh, Toronto's targeting these five building types, high rise, low rise, commercial office, commercial retail, and residential mixed use. Um, that's 80% of the new construction market that'll be happening in Ontario or in Toronto area. So you can see all different types of building forms, uh, they all have lots of nice windows, uh, so uh, um, we need you to be ready to supply the market. Uh, one thing I'll touch on briefly, when it comes to opportunity, so we have this massive opportunity called the Toronto Green uh, Standard. Most of the municipalities around Toronto are also looking to Toronto uh, for guidance, uh, and I could see perhaps one day that Toronto standard being adopted across the greater Toronto Hamilton area. And when you consider that, that Ontario houses about 50% of uh, um, Canada's population, uh, and most of that is in the GTHA, uh, you begin to understand just how massive, truly massive a market this is with really negligible penetration by high performance uh, passive house windows. Uh, and as, uh, uh, as we move forward, as the market moves forward uh, and the demand grows for uh, passive house buildings, high performance buildings, obviously there's going to be a, ne a huge need uh, for uh, fenestration products to meet that need. I, you know, and that's a theme I'll keep uh, coming back to is that uh, um, we need to be ready in Canada to provide this market with the high quality windows that, they, uh, that it will require. Um, I think the, what would break my heart as a former uh, a politician is to see these fenestration products by the hundreds of thousands uh, being imported into Canada. Toronto Community Housing, uh, and I may have a slide on this later on, but I'll mention it now. Toronto Community Housing is the second largest social housing provider in North America, second only to New York, uh, uh, New York City. They have received uh, billions of dollars of commitments from uh, federal government, uh, a bit of money from the province of Ontario uh, because their social housing is, uh, is so run down. Um, they have a plan to take 200 of their mid and high rise buildings over the next few years and, and renovate them to um, 
essentially the interfit, the passive host interfit standard. So that 70 to 75% energy savings, simpler mechanical systems I was talking about earlier on. That's what Toronto community housing is going to do for a whole host of reasons. Um, but you know, among them, a better living experience for the folks who, you, who uh, have need of Toronto social housing, but also for savings, energy savings and, and maintenance savings. Their early estimate, and this is from about a year ago, their early estimate is that first tranche of buildings that they're gonna renovate and they're, they're moving down the line quickly to, they're not waiting to 2030, they're on this right away. Um, and I know because we're giving them some advice about, uh, about energy modeling. Their first tranche of buildings, they will require somewhere in the order of 200,000 high performance windows. Um, these are windows that, that will need to be uh, engineered and built to um, essentially a passive house standard. I know uh, Al has been involved in, uh, in, in the sub subcommittee uh, looking at these windows. We've had uh, our, own, uh, our own technical people looking at uh, those standards and, and we're happy with them at passive house. We're happy with them. They're uh, excellent standards that, that should meet the need of the energy modelers. But, Again, what would worry me is that um, we're just not ready here in Canada to meet that need of, of the Toronto community housing and it's 200,000 order, um, let alone uh, as uh, uh, commercial space, retail space or commercial space owners have also pledged to uh, renovate much of their commercial space throughout the GTHA. Um, and I have no idea how many square meters of glass that's going to mean, but it's going to mean an awful lot. So let's get ready. Uh, and Pacifos is here to help you uh, get ready to the best of our ability. Uh, what I like to say, you know, we're Pacifos Canada. Uh, we, uh, we know that uh, the highest building standard there is, is the Pacifos Institute building standard. That's the one we teach. That's the one we talk about. But we're really here to do more than that. We're here to, to help government, to help industry uh, prepare for the high performance building future. And I'm gonna use Toronto's path to zero uh, as an example. You know, we like to say there are, there's a number of building standards that are out there ranging from national code, the national building code, right up to Passive House Institute. So <coughs> you could, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're quite happy if, if people, uh, there are many paths to reduce your energy usage. We look at, uh, we look at Toronto's path here and we can see that uh, we have our conventional buildings at 2018, 2022, we're looking at tier two, three and four. Uh, by 2026, we'll, they, they will be allowing uh, tier three and tier four and by 2030, only tier four. Um, tier four is in essence a passive house building, a passive house institute uh, standard building. So you can uh, you can improve uh, your building by using you know a, a variety of uh, green building standards uh, by uh, using uh, the American uh, passive house standards. But if you want to get to tier four, uh, then you have to go to Passive House, and that's where we're gonna be by 2030. And virtually all the other tiers require high performance glass as well. So regardless, we're heading down that path. So we talk about Toronto and the massive opportunities in Toronto, but uh, I can point to Hamilton has made huge gains in building Passive Houses, Windsor, Ottawa, all building buildings to Passive House standards. Um, and then of course, there's Vancouver, you know, and it wasn't long ago, uh, I think 2016, uh, passive, house, uh, passive Houses represented less than 5% of the uh, building uh, applications that the city of Vancouver uh, had come across its desk. Um, and as this slide points out, in 2020, 19% uh, of rezoning applications uh, are for Passive House Institute buildings. So a massive uptake. Uh, and I put these uh, twin towers in uh, this Vancouver slide 
to demonstrate that Pasifos just isn't single residential buildings or small MERBs or small commercial buildings, but big towers as well, with a fair amount of glass in them, it looks like to me. So uh, this is the story right across Canada um, as, as communities big and small um, do their part to address climate change, do their part to reduce building emissions and, uh, and move us ahead. Uh, in Toronto, if, let me back up. Internationally, buildings represent about 39% of the yearly total of greenhouse gas emissions. That's internationally. All the buildings in the world account for about 39% of the GHG emissions. Vancouver uh, is about 52% of its greenhouse gas pollution uh, comes from buildings. In Toronto, it's about 53%. And that's pretty much the norm for communities across our country. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, you know, we were on a, a fantastic path to uh, low energy buildings. You remember R2000, for example, um, and we got lost along the way. Maybe energy uh, is fairly inexpensive if you look at, uh, um, natural gas energy, so uh, you know, good insulation and good windows weren't really required because you just turn the furnace up a little bit and it only cost you a few more dollars. But we've got a lot of catching up to do because of that. So some of the features, some of the building features of a, a passive house. And, and let me address the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Why are we calling it passive house when it's clearly more than houses? Uh, and I will say, uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to blame that on a very unfortunate translation from the German, uh, Passive House, H-A-U-S, uh, to a literal English translation. But clearly, if you look at these buildings, Passive House is more than houses, more than single family residences, towers, uh, uh, you know, condominiums, apartments, uh, government space. Uh, hospitals, schools, community centers, there's a, any building, any built form uh, can, uh, can be a passive house. But some of the features we have is our, our, our buildings tend to be uh, more compact. They're not sprawling with arms and uh, different wings in them. They tend to be more compact. Uh, they are highly insulated, highly insulated envelopes, you know, like this much insulation in them. Um, they're airtight. I talked earlier about airtightness testing and uh, airtightness is, is one of the ways you check for quality assurance in the build. High performance windows properly installed. And, uh, you know, I know I'm preaching to the converted here, uh, you can have the best window in the world, but if we don't have the people who are trained and available to install these windows, uh, then we're, it's all for naught. And I, I hear from small contractors in Toronto, uh, in, in Southern Ontario, well, virtually everywhere in Canada, who are building to passive house standards and have incredible difficulty finding people who know how to install a, a, a passive house window, a high, a high performance window. So we're gonna have to put our heads together with uh, your folks at Fenestration Canada and, and see uh, if we can help come up with a solution to, uh, to fix that. We certainly recognize it's a problem. Uh, these buildings are thermal bridge free design and as our short little video showed uh, that it makes it extremely difficult for for heat to leave the building in the winter time and for heat to come into the building during the summertime. <coughs> There's good external shading. Uh, obviously, you know, a passive house is passive in that it passively uses the sun to be heated in the winter time and it uses uh, shading, whether it be trees or some type of uh, overhang, to shade it, to passively shade it in the summertime to keep the heat out in the summer and let the sunlight, the heat of the sun in, in the wintertime. Um, and I will say, the video talked about heating the house uh, by you, and that's actually quite accurate. Um, we have, uh, 
I was uh, I know an architect who told me that he built he designed a big house with no furnace and the uh, the client said well how will we heat it and he said well you and your wife but maybe a house this big you should get a couple of large dogs uh, and you'll be more than more than toasty if we have any problems with passive house it's that uh, uh, overheating especially as climate change comes to play and we have hotter longer uh, 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 heat waves. Uh, we have uh, um, a system that is set up that will comfortably keep you warm in the winter time. But unless you know what you're doing as an architect, energy modeler, engineer, um, you can easily overheat in the summertime. And uh, and so that's something that that Passive House Canada is addressing. The the international standard doesn't really address it that much, but we are at Passive House Canada. Uh, it's one of the ways we're sort of uh, uh, tweaking that that international standard a bit to recognize that Canada is different in that we have uh, not only cold winters, we have ex in parts of Canada exceptionally hot, dry summers. High performance ventilation with heat recovery. So uh, we know it's not a good idea to have an airtight house uh, because it, you build up of uh, of uh, toxins in the air, whether it be carbon monoxide, dioxide, or, or the smell of the fish you cooked two days ago. So you have to have good quality ventilation with heat recovery. And I kid you not about the smell of the fish. I had a custom home builder tell me two weeks ago that he knew he'd built an airtight house. He didn't need to test it. He knew it was an airtight house because when his client cooked fish, they could smell it in the air two days later. Uh, yeah, beautiful looking house. Don't know if I'd want to live there though. High performance ventilation with heat recovery uh, and uh, all of that leads to this quality assurance. And what we find growing um, in Ontario, and I'll tell you, Ontario is just at the cusp, but it's really starting to take off um, again with, uh, with, with residential development, with, with individual members, homeowners who are hearing about this passive house thing, this high performance thing that's out there and they're investigating it and they want one. So uh, almost not a day goes by where we don't get a phone call from uh, the public or um, architects who need to take some training. Um, I will say that uh, uh, when I look at traffic to our website, uh, Passive House Canada's website, it makes sense that the majority uh, of that uh, traffic would come from the West Coast because the West Coast is where the Passive House really caught on and where it's really taken off. Vancouver, Victoria, Richmond, virtually all the communities have bought into the Passive House way of building. Um, Ontario less so. Yes. Yes, we, we're, we're coming up to four o'clock. Okay. Um, so just thought I'd uh, let you know we should. We're, should we're running out of time, are we, Al? Yes. And I, I always worry that, uh, that, I don't, uh, that I won't have enough slides. I won't be able to keep us going. Uh, but clearly, uh, I've learned the art of talking from uh, my years as a politician. Are there any questions, Al? Because I'd hate to end this without having answered questions. Actually, uh, no, we don't have any questions from, uh, okay. from our, our viewers. So. Okay, well, we'll keep going. I, I'll, I'll go really fast just for another minute or so, Al. Uh, I, I just want to keep driving home the fact that uh, the future is now. We can't wait to 2030 to have the fenestration industry uh, wake up and say, okay, now's the time. Uh, the market is growing in Ontario. The web traffic shows it. A year ago, 95% of our traffic came from the West Coast. Now it's split between West Coast and Ontario. Ontario is waking up to Passive House. The amount of people we're training from Ontario is tremendous. The designer consultants I was telling you about. Uh, so we are at the tipping point right now, I would say, uh, where uh, uh, Passive House building, high performance building is going to take off. Um, let me scoot along here, Al. Uh, yes. Here's my favorite saying, it's not rocket science. Just so it's you know, simply, I mean, even if we go a little after, it's not going to be a big deal, but we okay. will try to, to end this around that time. So if there's questions or, or if there's something okay. important that you didn't mention, it's, it's okay, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I will, uh, I will skip ahead 
to, uh, um, here's a couple of interesting slides. Uh, this is what passive house is great at, temperature stratification. Scientists tell us that if there's a certain difference between how cold our feet are and co how cold our head is, we notice it. But if we can lower that stratification, uh, uh, it makes our, uh, it makes our uh, sense of how that house is much better. This is a, a normal code type home, and here we have a passive house. So here's my, ah, the effects of cold glass. We finally get to it. Uh, you know, that uh, good quality uh, 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 windows with a low U, uh, we have a, a radiant temperature and we're gonna have experts in the audience who actually understand this stuff. Al, you obviously, and Stefan, you are obviously two folks who will understand what we're talking about. But that radiant temperature uh, symmetry of, of 5K is too high uh, and we, we get warm glass, we get that U value of, you know, 0.7 uh, a radiant temperature difference of 3K, and now suddenly uh, the room has less stratification. We don't need a heating source by every window, uh, and it is, uh, uh, it's much nicer. Okay, moving along here. Um, yeah, uh, the impacts of high-performance buildings on the fenestration industry, uh, high-performance values, renewed focus on innovation, larger share of projects, uh, of project budget for fenestration, and, and a position for you know, international excellence, uh, because it's not just about developing a product for sale in Canada. You know, let's face it, Canada isn't the biggest market. It's what can we export? What can we export south of the border into the States? What can we export uh, overseas? It would be lovely to take uh, Canadian fenestration products and be able to see them marketed uh, in uh, the EU. Uh, and we'd be, we'd be very happy to see that sort of thing happening. Um, political leadership, et cetera, et cetera. We need political leadership. Uh, I talked about uh, Toronto community housing and uh, the fact that it's leading by example. Um, I will tell you that across Canada, I believe the estimate is at least 30% of construction is government funded. So it's government, government infrastructure, government buildings, social housing, all of the buildings that, 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 that governments are involved with from the municipal to the federal, and they are all committing to move to high performance buildings. Uh, and that's 30% of the market. That's pretty significant. They're not waiting to 2030. By 2030, we have to be there. Um, let me skip ahead a bit more. So we're very big on, on talking to government about triggering change uh, uh, and uh, to scale uh, in three ways. Uh, you know, purchase power, governments have purchase power, 30% of uh, construction will be government funded. Uh, governments have the communication power uh, and the regulatory authority to move things ahead. So I will, uh, I will simply say, uh, I'm sorry if, uh, if I rambled at all, but we'd really love you as members of the fenestration industry to, to join the movement to high performance buildings. This is the way the world is going. Canada has to go along with them. Um, I will say one last thing uh, that's really driving a lot of this not only is it about addressing climate change through reducing uh, a building's GHG emissions, it's about making sure that, that our exports and uh, are, are able to enter uh, other countries without being taxed. If we do not meet our Paris Accord commitments, uh, other countries that are will uh, we'll look to punitive measures to, uh, to tax our imports or our exports, their imports from Canada. So there's a whole host of reasons we have to do this. Uh, we have to get on board with, uh, with high performance buildings. Least among them is uh, 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 developing a, an export market. Most critical thing though is to uh, fix our building stock to make it uh, healthy, comfortable, climate resilient, affordable, and low energy. So I'll stop there. And I hope there's a question. Yes, or, yes. We, or, we, we actually have a highly relevant question here. Okay, good. 
you're, you're mentioning, you know, the hope that, that Canadians will be able to have an export market for high performance windows. We have a question here from Pauline. Will we need a program to qualify windows as Passive House approved? Some companies have already lost work on Passive House products to imports that are qualified to Passive House in Europe. Mm -hmm. Even though yeah. the ratings of the Canadian windows are just as good. Yeah, so yeah. Pauline is raising a, a question that it's, uh, it's a it's a super good it's a super good question and and here's the here's the here's the answer uh, no uh, to 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 qualify for a high performance building you know we're not Passive House Canada is not looking to see our label on every window or building component um, but the components need to meet uh, a, a certain uh, level of engineering, a certain design excellence uh, that uh, some third party will have to certify, an engineering uh, party will have to certify. So uh, I talked about all the windows for uh, Toronto community housing. Um, you know, those are in essence being built to Passive House, uh, the Passive House standard, but they don't need to be Passive House certified, but they need to be at that really high level. We find companies like to get Passive House certified uh, because it makes it easier to sell, right? They don't have to, you know, if, if I'm the architect or the engineer and I'm specifying windows for a big project uh, and I see that this product has been specified, in fact, it automatically shows up in our energy modeling software because it's certified, makes it easier for me to specify that um, that window uh, compared to another window that's just as good, but hasn't gone through the certification process. So, um, you know, we're we're talking to Fenestration Canada. We've uh, about how we can expedite that. How Passive House Canada can expedite the uh, uh, the certification of these windows. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll do our best to keep highlighting uh, made in Canada products to our architects and engineers. Many times we have people who just aren't aware of what's out there or they always specify a certain manufacturer so they're not going to change. Uh, we want to change that. We want, we want Canadian pro projects using uh, Canadian uh, products. I hope that answers it, Al. Well, and I'm hoping that, that projects like Toronto Community Housing will, will create a demand for locally made products you know absolutely so, uh, yeah you know, it, it's one thing to import a set of windows for a house uh yeah. if you had to replace them if if it didn't work out whatever you know what are you going to do but it's it's you know if you have a, a high-rise building full of windows that need replacement parts that have some kind of defect that needs to be remedied um you know mm -hmm. where will your supplies come from so yeah, uh, yeah. so i think there's absolutely yeah, you know, this I, is this I, is public money being spent on public, you know, in essence, public projects, and and we have to keep the benefits, uh, of the benefits of that spending here in Canada. Uh, I jokingly said to the folks at Toronto Community Housing early on that when you look at what Toronto Community Housing requirements are for uh, passive house windows, and you look at uh, um, you know future plans for uh, the Toronto's two school boards. Uh, they'd be wise to all come together and uh, uh, you know and and work together to uh, uh, to uh, to invest in a company or to work with companies to do this. But um, when this is taxpayers' money, a Canadian taxpayers' money paying for this, the benefits really need to stay in Canada. So uh, so the answer is no. You don't need a passive house sticker on the window, but it probably makes sense because it'll be easier to put in front of architects and engineers if you do with respect to the certification portion yes yeah. yes, yes absolutely. absolutely yeah yeah and uh i wonder if are there no we don't have any more questions at the moment okay um, we we um i don't know if our all our members are aware but we, we there is a canadian methodology for using yes. a window uh, that can be used to design to the pacifist requirements and the document actually shows what are the metrics? One of the challenges, I think, with the Passive House windows is that you are measuring different properties. 
And some of the properties that are necessary to qualify the window for passive house are not measured under the NFRC system. Right. And so learning to, to which properties are measured and using the Canadian methodology for evaluating those properties can help Canadian manufacturers understand and report the parameters that are going to be mm -hmm. useful or necessary for use in the, in the passive house planning package. So um, we'll probably have a workshop on that uh, on another date, but uh, I just I hope so. yeah. put in a plug for the Canadian methodology that can take your right. existing therm files and generate passive house metrics from them. So. And, and we're, we're happy to have a copy of that document, Al, that I know you were involved with. Uh, we're happy to have a copy of that, uh, that document on our website. And we, uh, um, we're looking to do more with your organization and your, mem your, your members. I know we are uh, talking with members of your industry right now who are interested in certifying and, and understanding what that path is. Uh, and we are, we're bringing on an additional technical person who's a certifier uh, who uh, will hopefully be able to expedite and reduce the cost uh, to that certification because at the end of the day, uh, there is a, uh, there, there's going to be huge demand for passive house windows or windows made to uh, passive house high performance standards uh, and they really need to be made in Canada. Well, I, th I think we appreciate hearing that, that you know, Passive House Canada is, is uh, uh, you know, feels a, a commitment to Cana the Canadian window industry to mm -hmm. be able to uh, participate in, in this growing market and, uh, and, and, and to, um, um, uh, in other words, that this isn't just a market for, for imported windows. I think we should look at right. imported windows as a necess maybe a short-term necessary thing to get through. Mm -hmm. But I think we're going to have to work on the market drivers that will help to make Canadian products uh, absolutely. You know, affordable and desirable in the passive house world. So Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I don't mind, as you said, I don't mind if someone wants to build their house with, uh, with imported windows, whether they come from Europe, China, Turkey, uh, you know, that's up to them. Maybe a little dangerous if they have to go find parts later on. Uh, but I do not want to, uh, you know, we, we, we'll work closely with you so that we can support your members uh, because there are some unique characteristics that um, social housing units require when it comes to windows. You know, maybe they're not that European style window. Maybe we need to develop the, uh, the North America, you know, a Canadian style of window that's suitable for social housing. Um, there'll be a heck of a market across North America because it's not just Canada. The United States is redoing so much of it, its affordable housing projects uh, all over. Uh, and uh, we hear constantly that uh, they're buying components, they're buying their, their HVAC systems from the manufacturers in, uh, in Canada. They should be buying their windows from Canada as well. We'll do what we can to help you. I'll look forward to working with you in future. Sounds good. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. So thanks, uh, thanks, Chris. I just want to mention to uh, everyone on the line, if you want to participate in the last event of the day, it's a social event presented by Novatech. It's a bingo night. So there's prizes to win. Uh, the winner gets a pretty big prize, actually. So uh, for those who want to participate, just uh, go look in the education session and you can uh, just follow the link there uh, and you should have received the link in your emails also so i hope to see you there thanks again chris thanks al uh thanks to quanex as presenting sponsor and if i don't see you uh, at this uh, social event i hope i'll see you tomorrow bye everyone thanks everyone. Bye -bye. thank you chris